style. Are you telling like, me there's Kristen Bell material out there? I have <laughs> not Kristen seen. Bell, yeah, watch Family yeah. Game Fight. Yes, Dak you Shepard should. And, it's yeah, hilarious. they do a game show. Family I game love yes, Kristen it's Bell. Hilarious. It's hilarious. Dak Shepard is one of the Hulu. few people on the on. planet I am jealous of. Hulu. Watch it. Oh, Kristen Bell <laughs> yes. is your human. Family Game Fight. I've, I've got a lot of humans. Oh, okay. I mean, I don't drink and I don't smoke generally. So you got so This is an illusion. <laughs> oh, um, gotcha. Hey guys, I'm Chris. And I'm Wendy. From ToastedMarshmallowAdventures.com. And you're watching Toasted Marshmallow Adventures Podcast. Idaho's premier podcast for comedy and entertainment. We know now more than ever, people are looking for ways to escape, and laughter is the best medicine. On this show, we talk to comedians and entertainers from around the world. So if you're a fan of stand-up comedy or just looking to take a break from life, we got you. We keep things light and fun, laughing as much as possible with occasional deep, thought-provoking moments intertwined. So if you're in a safe space, grab a cold one. Hit the subscribe button on your favorite audio platform or YouTube. <laughs> Uh, and share, and, sh and share some laughs with us. We are okay. I wasn't right. Yeah. And share some laughs with us. We, we are toasted, toasted marshmallow adventures. adventures. We don't have a hype button. No. Pew pew pew. pew. Hi, I'm Chris. And I'm Wendy. And welcome to the Toasted, toasted marshmallow, marshmallow Adventures podcast. podcast. Woo! Tonight in our Boise studio, we have improviser Robert Long yes, with us. Do. Thank you so much for being here today. Been a long time coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Pew, pew, pew. Pew, pew. We got it. We got it. Cypha <laughs> Sounds. Oh, yes. Created this. They, they say that. Yeah. Can I cuss? <laughs> Heck oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, so yeah. Being heck yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Anything goes. Yes. And just a competitive question. What's your best viewership on a single episode that I need to beat to be your most oh. listened to podcast ever? It depends on YouTube versus Give me like, the big number. Gabriel Rutledge has a few hundred. Yeah, I think views. he's at a few hundred. Yeah. And oh, audio Sam Tripoli. Well. Really yeah. high. So yeah, yeah, I would say probably for a single episode. Probably around like three to four hundred. Okay, that's how many I sent out. That many Instagram <laughs> invitations. Did you really? Oh, good, so. good, good, good. Oh, right, speaking go of that, soon. we got to go live. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, let's start with how we initially saw Robert. Oh yes, it was at the Idaho Pun Slam, yes. uh, mm -hmm. the one they had outside last year. That was the first one I did. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. And uh, We're yeah. like, who's that dude? <laughs> so, thank you. How did you? Uh, what made you decide to do the pun slam? Well, ironically, that was the last good night with my last relationship. Oh, ah. That was the last night we were happy. The next day, everything <laughs> fell apart. Oh, okay. um, so she it's a very there? yeah. It's a, she went with me. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, and um, I had been eyeing the pun slam via social media for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. I was mostly doing improv at another theater. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was doing uh, improv at another theater and I had left it in like April. And so I was looking for performance opportunities and we did a show in Garden City at the end of August. And then I was like, I was going, I'd like to do the pun slam and I'd been eyeing it for a couple of months. So my then girlfriend went, yeah, let's go do that. Cause she had connections here. She knew people. And, and so we figured it'd be a good environment. And I went and tried it out. Did she go up or no? No. Okay. No. No. Was that your first pun slam ever? Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. It's yeah. funny because um, uh, one of her friends was there, and I know him through the improv community, and I went, yeah, I've never done a pun slam before, and he went, yeah, but that's like LeBron James saying he's <laughs> never played horse. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that was one of my favorite compliments of my entire that's career. Awesome. yeah. Yeah, so I whenever you t whenever I take a class, you know, like in college, I always stressed until the first test. Mm -hmm. So that first pun slam was a lot of anxiety for me. Yeah, because right. I was like, all right, I got to write. I, I took off because I like to write in private. Mm -hmm. and when when I do pun slam now, I go upstairs so I don't have to listen to the room noise. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was like really intensely writing and trying to make yeah. sure the set was perfect. And I stressed through the whole night until I got to the finals. Because my strategy was if I, if I can make the finals, I'm probably pretty safe because we do that in mm -hmm. improv so all the fast. time. Yeah. So I was pretty pretty confident in those skills. But the rest of it was writing. And I was like, yeah. am I going to be, is the writing going to be solid enough yeah. to get me yeah. through? Yeah, so. it was. 
Yeah, it was. I mean, yeah, watching your set uh, on the pun slam. I mean, honestly, when I saw it, I thought, like, that's the best pun slam set that I've seen. Oh, <laughs> so, shucks. And, this, I know. and this guy's been doing it for a long time, is how it felt. It nice. seemed like, yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. It did, definitely. I well, I mean, short form improv shows, uh, most of them end with a jump out one liner kind of game like mm. 185 so you're used to coming up with well what words are associated with the topic and what can i do with those words okay. really quickly right. you just usually have multiple other people going mm -hmm. but i'm used to filling that void so having one other person to go alternate with gives me plenty of time oh, nice. mm. to think of what to say next wow awesome and what's with the is the vest a and uh, oh, I should have. I was video. I, I should have worn a vest. I know. Oh, I'm like, what dang the it. heck? I was You're like, podcast, restless. podcast. I don't <laughs> have to wear yeah. the vest. <laughs> Is it a thing? Or um, when I started um dipping my toes back in the stand up world i decided to create a stage persona okay cuz part of my philosophy is you have to be on a level that tells the audience you have respect for your craft. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the goal is we'll dress better than the audience so they know you're taking it seriously. So when I started doing improv here in Boise and when I started doing stand up again several years ago, like 2018, I was like, well, we need a stage persona that says that because mm -hmm. so much of my improv was in uniform or with a group i mean we had a group called the blacklist in 97 through 2006 and we all wore white shirts and black ties and that was our okay. outfit so it's a stylistic choice that i'm okay being known for but i want the improv to be known as classy and artistic and we're taking it seriously and we respect it right but then i wear jeans with it because i have to move <laughs> right. uh, and i wear and and sometimes the torn knees is a sim symbol of i want this to be cool mm -hmm. on some level yeah. yeah even though i'm 51 and not cool <laughs> you're so cool <laughs> thank you so your set actually at the pun slam i think rivaled Matthew Brassard uh, at the oh, I know Comedy man. Fest the year before. Did you listen to that? Set? I did the one on cosmetics. No, no uh, Halloween. Was it Halloween? Yeah, Brassard wasn't the one on cosmetics. No, he did one on Halloween. Yeah. Oh, who was the one on cosmetics? I'm not sure. Just, that one blew my mind. <laughs> oh, really? See, yeah. I think uh, Matthew Brassard like just the jokes per minute were just like on point, and uh, yeah, he did a great set. Yeah, on. Broussard's an incredible roaster. Mm -hmm. And that's what I know him for. He shows up on the Comedy Central roast a oh, lot, gotcha. and I love his oh. work on those. Yeah, and knowing that, yeah, I, I wish I had been there that night. Yeah, to play with him. Yeah, that would have been great. Yeah, we didn't see any. Of, no, actually, we didn't see much of the Idaho Comedy Fest because we did nine podcasts during yeah. it with, wow. with comedians. Yeah, so we saw very few, very little comedy. Right. In that thing. So, yeah. <laughs> We came downstairs, wiped, and sat for half an hour. But yeah, sure. it. it's like yeah. nothing's funny no. anymore. <laughs> We're tired. <laughs> Nine. So, Were they all in a row? Uh, we had like three a day, which, mm -hmm. you know, an hour a piece. It's that's, yeah. It takes it out of you. Also, and, not knowing a lot of the comedians. No, we didn't know any of no, them, actually. Yeah. No, none of them we yeah. knew. And, you know, we had like Frankie French and Cypher Sounds, and we had Matthew Brassard and Jason Salmon and a few others. Yeah, not knowing anyone. so Trying to keep it fresh. And trying to keep some energy up. <laughs> yes. And then Frankie French is crying yeah, on the podcast. <laughs> What'd she cry over? Uh, her, her mom. Life, yeah. yeah, oh, her mom. yeah. Are you going to make me emotional? Are you, <laughs> you going to dig into topics? I say <laughs> you're not a true podcaster or a podcast guest until you've cried oh, on the podcast. Okay. I thought that was just Barbara Walters. I'm gonna work, I'm gonna work some up. You gotta ask me some hard questions. You gotta dig. Yeah. My mother passed away in 2020. Oh you can God. use that. If you want. Oh no! Oh, it's okay. We were. We won't get. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. We won't get our moms yet. So, uh, from talking to you, uh, I think uh, after an open mic one night, you said you prefer long form improv. Um. Yeah. Yeah. How much detail do you want? <laughs> well, can you tell us the difference between like improv, acting, and comedy? 
Oh my goodness, <laughs> that is a big, well, I was big just thinking question. That today, like improv is so close. Is it close to acting and comedy? Or? Well, improv is. If you drew a Venn diagram of improv, there's one circle for actor, there's one circle for director, and there's one circle for writer. Mm. And improv is where all three of okay. them over intersect. So there's okay, okay. Um, because you're writing your material on the spot as you go, yeah. and you also have to have the presence of mind as a director to know how it's staged, how it's edited, because one of the big unsung skills of improv is how well it's edited. And so knowing when to get out of a scene, knowing how to cut to another scene, that's its own skill mm -hmm. that falls into the directors. Actors don't have to worry about that. Right. So mm -hmm. a pure actor, as you're defining it, I assume, is one that's working from a script. Right. So they don't have to make ever, anything up. So I was a teacher for 20 years and I taught mostly theater. And my approach as a theater teacher was I'm going to teach you improv, which is reactive and spontaneous and works from your, your impulses as an actor to play the moment. And I'm going to teach you Shakespeare, oh. which is the polar opposite because it's about text analysis and planning and deconstruction and finding literary elements and memorization and it's as, as it's as intense as the as the acting spectrum gets. Right. So if I can get you to do all these planned cerebral activities and all these impulsive spontaneous activities everything else is in between those two. Mm -hmm. So if you can get those two, you can master any form of acting. Oh, wow. But an actor is doing a character analysis based on the text. They're planning. They're trying out different methods of saying the lines based on the moment. And it's all, it's all planning. Mm -hmm. Most of it is planning. Uh, improv is playing the moment and reacting from your instincts as a director and as a writer and as a performer at okay. the same time. Common. Oh, I caught that. I could, does that ever? Does that happen a lot? Uh, that's never that's happened before. That's never happened. <laughs> yeah. I've had people hit it, but not that fully push it away impressive, from them. That was impressive, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's enough of that. Um, I, I have a friend who uh, there are multiple friends that say this actually that say the worst thing that ever ha happened to improv is somebody stuck the word comedy next to it. Oh, mm, okay. Um, because okay, that, yeah, that's always my impression is it's going to be funny. And usually it is okay. because discovery and spontaneity lends itself to the unexpected. And the pure rule, the core rule of comedy is the unexpected response or the inappropriate response. Mm -hmm. No matter how many rules of comedy you break down. And I have a friend who wrote a thesis that identified six different major forms of comedy, and that's it. And then I used to work from uh, the inappropriate response and the juxtaposition of ideas as concepts behind comedy writing. But if you boil it, just like you can boil down any story to uh, a stranger comes to town. Um, and we could talk about six different types of story and Hemingway's six word story and all that. Comedy can be boiled down to the unexpected response. Like comedy and horror are very close to each other. Right. The difference is the stakes. In horror, you know people are going to die. And in comedy, you know they're not. Mm -hmm. But the structure is roughly the same, which is why horror comedies work so right. well. And you don't know whether the character is going to die or not because you don't know whether you're in horror or comedy at any given moment. Mm -hmm. Cabin in the Woods is one of my favorite movies. Okay. Um, improv is easily applied to comedy or comedy is easily applied to improv because everything is unexpected, because it's all made up. Now, in my thinking, uh, comedy itself breaks down to three major types. Like if you're building a comedy theater, you want sketch, you want stand-up, and you want improv. But even in dramatic works, you have moments of comedy because you have to break it up. You have to give an audience a, a break from the unrelieved pressure and tension of the dramatic moment. Of course, you have exceptions to that, like the movie Seven Pounds. Have you ever watched no. Will Smith's Seven Pounds? I uh, maybe. Oh, yeah. Never watched it, no. Yeah, it's, and you find out Seven Pounds is the weight of the human heart because he's trying to it's, – it's two hours of unrelieved drama. Really? Wow. And it's just so Intense. heavy, and you leave it feeling exhausted. 
But with most drama, you want moments of levity that break it up. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I love is dramatic improv. Mm. Because even in a piece of long form, somewhere in the middle of it, you should have a piece that has heart that slams into the audience and makes them think about it. Uh, in, a, in a piece of comedic long form, there's that dramatic scene in the middle that anchors the whole thing. Oh, okay. Um, so comedy and drama are genres, and improv is usually comedy, but... It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to yeah. be. A mm-hmm. skilled improviser uh, can grab the dramatic elements of it and play for it. When I was in college, and feel free to cut me off if you want to move on to another question, uh, when I was doing my undergrad in theater... Um, I was about four years in, three years into my improv career. And I remember we were doing every teacher uses improv, whether they admit it or not. Um, and even the acting teachers that poo poo improv, they will throw improv (laughs) games in and then not admit that it's improv. Mm -hmm. So this was an improv, this was an acting teacher who hated improv and she made us play a game called secrets. And you draw a slip of paper that has a secret on it, and then you have to play your piece of the scene from that in, informed uh-huh. point of view. Mm-hmm. And most of the scene we did was laying down, and it was two married people that had fallen out of love with each other, and we, it was very patient, and it was very mature, and in the end, the, the audience was weepy because Whoa. I had I had gotten weepy. Uh-huh. Mm. And I never told anybody in the room, yeah, I've got allergic reactions to the cut grass outside. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so Perfect. the tearful part is real yeah. easy to play, yeah. but you just use everything. And wow. people leave those performances going, I didn't know you could do that with improv. Wow. Yeah. Which is one of my favorite things about doing improv around yeah. here, because I can show people what I, the forms that I know how to do, and people go, I didn't know you could do that with improv. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which leads us back to short form versus long form. What yes. is the difference? What's the difference between short form and long form? Okay, uh, short form... Is it just time? No. Oh. No. I mean, you could look at it that way. That's the simplest way to break it down. Uh, Short form is what you're familiar with as game-based improv. Okay. So most of what you see on Whose Line Is It Anyway, Mm -hmm. uh, the games they play, those are all short form improv. Mm -hmm. Long form improv is, um, as you said, time-based. Long form is generally 15 minutes or longer. A short form set, a short form game is usually four to six minutes. They can be shorter. Emotional Symphony usually doesn't run more than two. Mm-hmm. They can be longer. Shakespeare runs six to eight. Mm-hmm. Um, but the base of a long form improv isn't those. I need to come back to the word gimmick. It isn't those games, and I probably need to go in a little more depth there. The core of a long form is the scene work. Uh, and the base building block of the long form is the two person scene. Mm-hmm. Short form says it is, but short form's built around that game structure, and that's really what you're playing. Right. The premise is decided for you mm-hmm. uh, because it's that game structure. Um, long form, you have to find the premise through exploring well, the ideas. The improv. And you, yeah, and you oh, have to okay. figure out this is what the scene is about, mm-hmm. and I'm playing a relationship or I'm playing a game. You have to make decisions within the structure it's a difference between checkers and chess Mm -hmm. oh i get it yeah does that make sense yeah for sure i i the first decade of my career was spent in short form Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was when i was i left my mom's house when i was when i was 17 and i got an audition a month after i turned 18 for a comedy sports troupe in california um the los angeles yeah. Okay. Bakersfield. Uh, the Los Angeles troupe opened November of 1988, and there was somebody from Bakersfield at one of their dress rehearsals, and she went, I got to do this. I got to figure out how to do this. So she contacted the league office in Milwaukee, uh, which is the place to see comedy sports. If you're ever in oh, Milwaukee, huh. go see comedy okay. sports. It's mm-hmm. different, and I can give you the history of comedy sports if you want. If you want to <laughs> delve into that, I love telling those stories. Um, but she contacted the league office and she contacted a talent agency in Bakersfield and I held an audition in March and I went to that and I got it. And so what is that audition like? They played three games. Oh, okay. Uh, they played, I know they played object freeze because I remember holding up a paper clip and going clipping and throwing a ref flag and 
I remember using a shoe as an accelerator pedal. <laughs> uh, what else did they play? So they play games. Yeah, they played to... three games. Okay. And mm -hmm. they just want to see your aptitude for the games. Oh, okay. And my audition for short form, when I audition people for it, is very similar. I play three games. Mm -hmm. I play Emotional Symphony, I play Freeze Tag, and I play Dr. Know-It-All. And they're all to explore what skills do you have as an improviser. Okay. Um, because they do different things. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of short form. Short form takes skills in isolation and builds a game around one or more of them. So I've San Francisco is very divided as an improv community between the short formers and the long formers. And in my experience, they both didn't like each other. Oh, really? Yeah. It's a very theatrical city. So the long formers look at the short formers, in my experience, as you're not doing art. Oh, weird. Mm. And the short formers look at the long formers as you aren't pleasing the audience. Wow. Or whatever. I'm not yeah. I'm not steeped yeah. in San Francisco. So when I was when I did a workshop there I called a peacemaker because I was a long form improviser who came up learning short form improv, mm. developing all those skills in isolation, and I showed them you ever seen Karate Kid? Yeah. yeah. So you have that montage of Miyagi teaching Daniel all the chores. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he's teaching all these skills in isolation. And he goes, okay, now defend yourself. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, gotcha. yeah, yeah. Well, now all these skills have been blended Put together. together. Yeah. Long formers don't have long form without those skills. Mm -hmm. And short formers are better at developing them. Oh, I because see. they're done in isolation. Mm -hmm. So I was like, look at each other for what you bring to the form mm -hmm. and realize there's value in both oh, and bridge yeah. that gap. Mm -hmm. So at this point in my career, to get back to your original question, um, I spent a decade in short form. I segued into sketch and then the sketch group, um, the blacklist, we segued into reverse engineering long form because we didn't have anybody in Bakersfield that could teach us how to do it, and none of us were driving down to L.A. <laughs> All right. And then, uh, so we reverse engineered long form, and eventually I went through I.O. to codify what I knew. Um, but I already, I mean, by the time I went through I.O., I was 25 What's years. What's I.O.? Uh, improv Olympic. Oh. Uh, they're originally called, imp uh, so here's some improv history for you. Um, you get the compass in 1955. And the compass is started by Paul Sills, who is the son of Viola Spolin. Viola Spolin is the grandmother of modern improv. She wrote improvisation for the theater. Oh, cool. Uh, and, and she codified a bunch of improv exercises or games because, in her opinion, you were using them as a director to help actors figure out how to make their performances. Mm. And in 55, the compass decides they're going to do improv as its own art form. And out of the compass grows Second City. Okay. And Second City does not see or did not see improv as its own art form. Hmm. Second City's opinion for a long time was improv is meant to serve sketch. You use improv to develop premises, to write drafts of sketch, and to revise the, the material that's in those sketches until the sketches are as good as possible. Right. Well, then there were performers within Second City, um, and we're talking about Del Close, who were going, no, improv is its own art form and I'll prove it to you. So Close and Charna Halpern jumped to divide off their own, and they started the Improv Olympic. And Improv Olympics uh, philosophy is improv is the end. The, the process is the product, mm -hmm. which is the, the thing a lot of us hold to at this point. Mm -hmm. The process is the product. Mm -hmm. You just get real good at the process. Yeah. And then um, – yeah, the the IOC, the International uh, Olympic Committee, sued Improv Olympic and said you can't call it, you right, can't use right, the word right. Olympic. Yeah. <laughs> so they changed it to IO. Oh, okay. Um, so it's just called IO. Close died in the mid '90s. Bill Murray paid for his funeral. Aww. Uh, yeah, there's, I love Bill. Did you read the book <laughs> Improv Nation uh, by okay. Sam Watt. I listened to it. Um, okay. But it's a real good history of the long form side of improv history okay doesn't touch the short form side totally different evolution um yeah 
Uh, so have you had jobs, J-O-Bs, through all, out all of this? Or can you sustain yourself on being an improvi- improviser? That is a wonderful question. <laughs> it- I designed my life to have fun and play. Mm-hmm. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> So when I was when I left home at seventeen, um, my my dad had to pay child support. Uh, oh no! For that final year. Well, I mean, then I turned Did he eighteen. Pay it to you? Yeah. Oh, nice. The arrangement was made that he would cut the check oh, directly to gosh, me. Gosh, amazing! Oh, so it was written in their divorce decree. They were divorced in Washington. That he also had to pay for four years of college. So he had to continue paying or, child support as long as I was enrolled full time in college. Wow. So my birthday is in February. Mm-hmm. And so it's flat in the middle of the year. Yeah. So when my birthday rolled around, I had to be enrolled full time in college, but I was still in high school. Wow. So my last semester of high school, I did independent study <laughs> and I had to do U.S. history and P.E. Mm-hmm. That was all I needed to graduate. How do you do PE independent study? <laughs> you turn in logs that you walked this right. week. <laughs> I was doing it because I didn't have a car and I right. had to get to work. Yeah. But my first semester of college was at a junior college and was loaded up with theater classes. Okay. So he had to pay child support through my through my college years. So I'm, I did my undergraduate degree in theater, and then I became a substitute teacher because ideally I was, and I also worked in television production, but ideally I was going to drive over the mountain to do uh, acting work in Los Angeles. Right. Didn't. Right. I just, I didn't like LA at the time. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to make the drive all that often no. to work central casting. Right. And so I kept procrastinating it. Mm-hmm. And I also, because I, I was supposed to go to UCLA in 1991. And there's a story behind that. And I didn't end up going because of a woman. Um, she begged me not to go. Otherwise, my life would have a very oh, different yeah, course. Oh, yeah, weird, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I became a substitute teacher. And that was all about making money but leaving the work. And, and then I got tired of substitute teaching. Uh, I got married had a couple of kids. Um, was managing video stores for a couple of years. That was fun. Because mm-hmm. I got lots of free movies. Yeah. <laughs> and I went back into teaching to see if it was more fun. And I taught theater because I figured it would be more fun if I had a relationship with the kids that didn't end at the end of the school day. Right. You know, that tomorrow we're going to work on the same thing we were working on. Uh, and it was. It was a ton more rewarding. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm doing improv and I'm doing sketch and I'm doing, yeah, all through all of that. But there's always a day job that goes with it. Right. I never really took the leap to try and do theater Mm -hmm. full-time. Did two master's degrees in education, one in 04, (laughs) one in administration in 14. Uh, And then I retired from teaching in 2018. Um, But I've been doing, I mean, I've taken breaks from it. Mm. Like I stepped away from improv in 06, and then I had students in 08 who went, we want to keep doing improv now that we've graduated, but we don't know how. Will you help us? (laughs) You're like, okay. Sure, one more more time. (laughs) I'm like Michael Corleone. Were you you here at that point? No, I didn't move here until 2020. Oh, okay. So two years. Yeah, so I was looking at retirement. From Bakersfield? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was looking at retirement from uh, teaching. And I got to do it early because of my blood pressure. Mm, so I'm okay. technically medically retired. Wow. Nice. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. They have to pay me half my salary for the rest of my life. Oh, nice. Wow. There you go. I'm on five five blood pressure medications. What? That is, That is the trade-off. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm currently only on one. And I'm going to keep it <laughs> there that you way. Go. <laughs> You're not 6'5", 325 pounds. <laughs> no. Are you 6'5"? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dang, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, well, usually, I noticed yeah. you were a very tall human. <laughs> I, I, I would stand up, but I don't. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> now my grandfather was six three, and my father's six one. My mother's five nine. Oh wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and then my son is taller than I am. Oh, is he really? Wow. Mm-hmm. wow. Yeah. Is your, is your are your kids here in Boise? Or are they back in California? Uh, they are in Vancouver, on? Washington. Oh, okay, gotcha. I've heard yeah. that's a cool place to live. Vancouver. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Rains a lot. Yeah. 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 I grew up in Vallejo. Not a beautiful place to live. Vallejo, <laughs> California. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Is that near San Diego? 
Uh, no, that's about right in between San Francisco and Sacramento. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's funny. That's that's bizarre because I talked to I had I found my new massage therapist today. Okay, oh, and I really loved. Thank you. <laughs> and I really loved her philosophy. And she lives between. I think she said she lived. She came from Fairfield. Oh, I lived in. Well, actually, I, my daughter was born in Fairfield when I, we lived in Sassoon City, which Crazy. is kind of a suburb of Fairfield. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I don't know where that is. Yeah. And she said, yeah, it's gone to shit. <laughs> That's it has, yeah, said. yeah. It's, it's all okay. gangs and shit. Oh, it's bad. And she said I, it's between Sacramento and San Francisco. I'm like, That's exactly, a beautiful yeah. drive, though. <laughs> yeah, so it goes Vallejo and then uh, Fairfield. Okay. So is, yeah, so they're very close. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> So Poison yeah, it's a that. it's a shit area. Like when I was a kid, <laughs> when I was a kid, you know, you could go and stay out all day and ride your bike all yeah. across town. But it just, as I grew up, became just like this gangs. Yeah, just gangs all over the place. Yeah, you're you know? talking to a guy who spent 40 years in Bakersfield. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I taught in a high school that had a gang reaction unit. Oh, really? Wow. And when you became a teacher there, they had to educate you in gang culture so wow. you knew what you were looking at. Yeah. Because Delano was the border between the Norteños and the Sereños slash Me okay. Mexicanos. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so you had to know, well, you're looking at one or the other and you shit yeah. might break out. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you don't want to say the wrong thing. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Anytime yeah. you see the number 13, it's a gang reference. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Really? Oh, okay. <laughs> Did not know that. Yeah. yeah. Also, bad luck. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, yeah, goes with it. So oh, we want to be bad luck, I say. <laughs> yeah. We are the bad luck. How did you meet Jen? How did you get associated with the lounge? How did I get associated with the lounge? Um, Was that through the pun slam, or had you known... Well, Did you I mean, know Tiffany and Dan and Jen Pryor. No, Pun Slam okay. helped. Um, when I left, I was I, so I came to Boise because I had friends and contacts who offered me opportunities in the two areas that I like to play. Mm -hmm. One of them being improv, and the other being comic books. Oh yeah, yeah. And so one person offered me a business partnership. He he, and I split from him. But he has stores in northern Idaho, which I encountered on my drive around the country in 2018. And he he found, and I had been buying books from him every month since I found his store. And so when he found out I was moving to Boise, he said, "Do you want to be my partner and find stores in Boise that we can make some money off of?" Mm -hmm. So I went okay. Uh, and also in the drive, I was looking for places that would let me play and or teach workshops. And I only got a couple of bites on teaching workshops. So I taught, I came through Boise twice. Um, once in, yeah, they were both summer of 2019. And I got some footage for stand up. And we had a couple conversations about whether I wanted to hook up and be a part of Comedy Sports Boise. And that didn't end up playing out, but I was offered opportunities to do improv um, by folks associated with Comedy Sports Boise. So having opportunities in both areas, I moved here. I worked at one theater for six months, and then I walked away from that theater uh, based on promises that didn't come to fulfillment. Um, and the woman I was dating, we met through Bumble – and in my bio, it says I'm an improviser and I will probably invite you to a show because it, <laughs> nice. it's low risk. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so she messaged me and she told me she was coming from the perspective of, oh, this guy thinks he's an improviser. Because oh. <laughs> she didn't know who I was mm -hmm. and she'd been an improviser in the scene for like 15 years. Uh -huh. So I must be a newbie who just came through a level one uh -huh. class, not knowing I had 30 years experience right. and so she came to a show she's like oh <laughs> this guy knows how to do improv <laughs> yeah so in walking away from that other theater we formed a small group of people who wanted to do improv under the ethics that we wanted to do improv because i have a different perspective on how improv works coming in as an outsider mm -hmm. and so we started looking around for well where can we play and this ex-girlfriend who is a 15-year uh, veteran, um, <laughs> really hoarding in on who it might be, huh? <laughs> um, had contacts here at the lounge. And she was like, well, we can connect with Jen. 
And so she started the conversation with Jen, and I met Jen and continued the conversation, and we did a show in the lounge, I want to say late October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was right after the breakup because she was in the show. Oh, jeez. <laughs> How'd that go? Um, well, everybody affiliated with us knew what they were looking at. Right, right. <laughs> the crowd didn't. The crowd did not. <laughs> and I managed to play a lot of it off, but she was coming at me hard. I bet she was. <laughs> yeah. And everybody was like, you okay? You okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm all right. I know, I I know where she's so, coming from. So people didn't know they were watching a breakup on stage. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a Halloween show because oh, she geez. came dressed. She was going to a Halloween party and she came dressed in the costume she was wearing to the Halloween party. Um, so we did that show and we did a couple of workshops in November and we held, we did a show in December and then Jen asked us if we wanted to go weekly starting in January. And so that relationship kind of grew. So it was fostered by the ex. Mm -hmm. Um, and then she left the picture in November and Jen seeing value in the relationship, um, backed us up. Oh, awesome. And awesome. we continue to work here and, and develop what we could do here. Yeah. Sweet. That's, how, that's why we love Jen. One of the reasons yeah, why we yeah. love Jen. She's just so, yeah. So let's get into that, actually. First, I have, before we get into the game show talk, and I don't know if you've heard about this from Jen yet, uh, but first I want to ask you your process, because uh, any improv I've been to, it seems like all the suggestions come from the audience. Is that correct? <coughs> ah, fireball. Yeah. <laughs> um, generally, yeah. Okay. Um, What's so, your process, I guess, is yeah, the question, once you are, get that suggestion? Yeah, suggestions are a really interesting topic in and of themselves, at mm -hmm. least to me as an improviser. Um, because the suggestion really only exists to prove to the audience that the material is not pre-planned. Mm. Oh. Okay. So if the audience trusts that you're making it up, you don't have to take one. Because, mm. I mean, you could, depending on how your, your suggestion theory works, you could take a suggestion and throw it away and make it unimportant and do a sketch that you wrote. Okay. So oh, give me a word, and I'll give you an example. Uh, skateboard. So if my word, if my suggestion is skateboard, I could approach it with the first line approach. Got my skateboard. Now let's go on to everything oh, else. Oh, I got gotcha. And it has nothing to do with the damn yeah, skateboard. Okay. Um, or you can do a scene that builds up to the need for a skateboard, wherein the skateboard is integral to, to the scene. Mm -hmm. That's another way of approaching it. Long form. Uh, the general approach is you take the word and the word is going to remind you of something. So for me, skateboard reminds me of rollerblades and I am six foot five, 325. I've attempted to learn to rollerblade a couple of times and it never goes well because I'm not comfortable with my center of gravity. So the suggestion of skateboard would lead me to the time that I wiped out on rollerblades mm -hmm. and dislocated my shoulder Ow. trying to stop because mm -hmm. I didn't know the pizza French fry method. <laughs> And so I got going real fast, and I was like, I'm going to wreck unless I – and I reached out and grabbed a chain link fence oh. to stop. <laughs> That's the process. Okay. So it's – it's it's it depends on what your philosophy of suggestion is. Okay. Um, in modern improv, there is an understanding within an actual – within an improv community that, yeah, we're going to make this up. Nothing is planned. Mm -hmm. So if you go see TJ and Dave in Chicago, they don't take a suggestion. Mm. because they know they're making it up. They actually had a documentary called Trust Us, We're Making This Up. Mm -hmm. And that's part of their lead-in. And they start by standing and staring at each other, and they stare at each other until one of them observes something about the other one that inspires a scene. Mm -hmm. And then they do a scene. You can do the same thing with movement on stage. Um, there's, there's plenty of ways to do it. So mm -hmm. the suggestion process itself is just a springboard to... What does this remind me of? What does this inspire? Mm, okay. At this point in my career. Gotcha. And then so that can either be like uh, something you've written prior or a personal experience or. It's never something I've written prior. Okay. Well, you mentioned something about a sketch. Uh, 
previously? Well, it was. Uh, a lot of times you take the you take the example from the audience or the idea to prove that it's not sketch. Gotcha. Like okay. start, that but it's way. really a weak proof. Mm-hmm. It's because it like, could start with just like yeah, I'm walking with a skateboard, and then you go yeah. off into something mm-hmm. else. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which has no inherent proof in it that it's not scripted right it's like yeah. you're trusting a magician that what they're showing you is true right yeah. but with most improvisers like 99 percent of them nobody's trying to pass off a sketch as something they improvise right. so don't don't take that away from what i just said mm. it's it's we're going to take the suggestion and that's going to inspire something and we're going to make all this up mm-hmm. it just it's how you use the improv like have you ever seen anybody play blind line no Okay, Blind Line is a game where (laughs) there's differing opinions on how to play it. Um, I like to send the players out of the room Mm -hmm. so that they don't know what lines you're getting. And then you get uh, a number of lines for the scene. To me, it's two times the number of players in the scene. Um, And you write them on slips of paper and you either throw them on the stage or you hand them to the players. Uh, Because they come back in and then they start improvising a scene and you pull one of the lines out and you read it and it becomes text to the reality of the scene you're playing. Oh, wow. And there's a couple of ways. There's really only two ways that blind line comes off. Um, Either the line feels forced and unimportant you read it, yeah. you say it, it gets a laugh, you throw it away, mm-hmm. and it doesn't mean anything to the future of the scene because you paid it off. Yeah. Or it's integral to the fabric of the story you're telling to the point that the zen is just there. And so the line, when you read it, feels like it's scripted, even though Everybody oh. knows it's not. I got gotcha. you. And I played a show at the zoo a couple of weeks ago with Andrew Lyman and Nicole Stull. And um, we, we, the ref, I'm sorry, ref is a comedy sports training thing. The MC was taking a relationship from the audience and he got three that he couldn't decide on. He got brother and sister, he got cousins, and he got strangers on a train. And whenever that happens to me as an improviser, I go, we'll do all of them. Right. Mm -hmm. So Andrew and Nicole were brother and sister, and I was the uh, the cousin they'd never met, (laughs) and we were all attending a family reunion on the train. Nice. Um, And at one point, the line I read was, say hello to my little friend, (laughs) which may or may not surprise you. That one comes up a lot. Oh, really? Yeah, because, I mean... (sighs) I call it the dead singer from Memphis phenomenon. Okay. When you ask for a type of suggestion, a lot of times you're only going to get certain things. Okay. If I ask you for a dead singer from Memphis, there's only one thing you're right. going to tell me. If I ask for a quote from a movie, there's only a few that audiences are going to come up Everybody with. Everybody knows. And this is one of the one of the tricks that wow. we pull out more things than men and go, yeah, we're going to disqualify. We're going to show you how it works and we're going to deconstruct that magic trick so we can make the game harder on us. Mm-hmm. One of the ones you always get is, have you ever danced with the devil in the pale moonlight? Okay. Uh, you always get, I'm going to need a bigger boat. I don't know that one. That's from Jaws. Oh. Uh, you get stuff that's iconic okay. and then everybody recognizes. Right. Well, say hello to my little friend yeah. is iconic. <laughs> yeah. And it comes up all the time. <laughs> wow. yeah. So I read say hello to my little friend and I look over to the bench because I need another character and I pull up Mike Whitry, um, and he plays my wife. Hervé Villachez. Michael Whitry, uh, just to bring it up, his roller derby ref name was Oliver Closeoff. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know Michael Whitry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, played uh, together. I, Fellow yeah. pun slam champion, <laughs> Michael yes, Whitry. I, when I played roller derby, yeah, he was a ref. And yeah, it was Oliver Closeoff. Oliver Closeoff, Oliver Closeoff <laughs> yes. My roller derby name was Shank Williams. <laughs> Is there Nine roller one derby one. here? I'd love yeah. to go see some roller oh, derby. Oh, yeah, there's roller derby. Actually, uh, the um, Treasure Valley Roller Girls just started playing again after the pandemic so they just had some big turn tournament at the uh expo idaho i gotta get out yeah. of the house more yeah yeah definitely go <laughs> see it um there's uh, way too much media co-ed <laughs> teams nampa has a co-ed team and a girls team and a juniors team there's roller derby all around here yeah i gotta see that yeah definitely go check it out so so blind line is an example of suggestion theory is it forced does it feel 
forced in, tacked on, and then thrown away so you can do the thing you wanted to do? Or does it feel integral to the scene right. that it is what you're doing is inspired by what the audience gave you mm -hmm. and that fabric is something you wove based on the suggestion and its inspiration? Mm. And you can pick that out of how different improvisers approach the suggestion. Yeah. Neither, none of them are right or wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just this is what you prefer to do and this is what I prefer to do. Yeah. I mean, when it's the end of the day, we're all practicing the art of making shit up. Right. Mm -hmm. What was that? What What did we see at For the what? lounge? Uh, uh, we saw these notes. You <laughs> and Cherie. Cherie, yeah. Yes. She's amazing. <laughs> yes. Did you see the scrotes? We were What's you there that? for the Scrotes during the mm -hmm. Yum Yum show? N uh, no. Oh, you were there, there for Don't Cry Kansas. I, no, we were there. I think this was after the was lounges little... birthday party, like the lounges. It, yeah, it was a little 15 minute. Yeah, it was you and I think <laughs> Cherie. Uh, you, Cherie, Jen, but Jen had to get off stage and Eugene uh, came up. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you did a song called Booty Juice, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is actually... Something I got to comment on because in the the skit, Booty Juice was a female that you know had a little gas or something, as Eugene explained it. But I worked in psych, and Booty Juice is the shot you get in your ass when you're <laughs> acting crazy. <laughs> but we, I remember thinking yes. it was amazing that Eugene was just called up, and he was like, "All right," and he he just went with it. I was like, "Dang, he's got skills," yeah, and you know. Because you and Cherie, were, yeah, you guys yeah. were amazing. It yeah. was awesome. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, really. Yeah, Cherie's a real talent. Yeah. She's one of the people that jumped with me when I left that okay. other theater and she was like, yeah, mm -hmm. I want to do what you do and I oh, want to keep nice. playing the yeah. way you play. Yeah. And Cherie is a real student of the sport, mm -hmm. as it were, mm -hmm. and she just eats up with a spoon everything I have to show oh, about cool. my yeah. career in improv. Yeah. So, yeah, she's she's anything I throw at her, she loves to do. Oh, that's awesome. Which is why yeah. it's great mm. that she's one of the partners in Things and Company. Yes. Yeah. Now, how did that get started? Well, I mean, the group that jumped from the other theater was called, we landed on the name Wonderworks. And then we're, there were six of us, and we lost two of them over the breakup. And so when the two people left over the breakup, we went, all right, we need to change the name because everything we built includes those two people. Mm -hmm. And we just, I'm, I personally, I'm like, I don't fucking care what the name is. Call, right. call whatever you want. I mean, look at the internet today. There's companies with Everything. nonsense words. Yeah. yeah. And as long as you can identify their brand, that's what's mat what right. matters. So you can call the improv company Shushi if you want yeah. to. Mm -hmm. We'll just get known for what we do. And then people will know, oh, Shushi imp equals improv. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Yeah. So they landed on the name Things and Company. I was like, cool, that, that's fine. Let's go. So Things and Company produces a bunch of different shows. The one we started with was More Things Than Men. And that came up while I was still working at that other theater. Um, and then when we jumped to Weekly, I started doing Big Tin Foil Ball at that other theater. Oh, yeah, the Big Tin Foil Ball, we which follow we follow on, on Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. And you have no idea how many arguments there were about really? whether we could keep calling it Big Tin <laughs> really? Foil Ball. Yeah, because yeah, when I left the other theater, people were like, well, Big Tin Foil Ball is part of that theater. And then other people were like, no, it's its own gimmick and its own thing. Oh, thing. Let's keep that intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And then there were people, including that ex, who went, I don't want to do that name. I don't want to do that. So when we split, we were like, I'm going to bring that back. And then one person in Things and Company went, yeah, I don't want to do that. So I don't want to <laughs> call it that. And so I was like, all right, can we just call it tinfoil? Um, <laughs> because the gimmick of the ball, I really like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because cool. as an improviser, I'm like, improvisers don't have resumes. They don't have portfolios because everything we do is left in the past. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So here's a way of doing a resume slash portfolio where we take the scenes that we want to remember and then we add them to the ball, yeah. and we post it on Instagram, mm. and that's the joy of the Big Tin Foil Ball. I've watched many things get crunched into the ball. <laughs> is, is the Tin Foil Ball in your possession? It is in Cherie's possession. Oh, Cherie, yeah. dang. How is big I, is it? It's nice. Yeah, oh, it's about nice. the size of a large softball at nice. this point. Okay. Because gotcha. I used to do all that myself, yeah. and I was like, I'd like somebody else to take right. this. And then Cherie had the vision of doing it like the Travelocity Gnome, mm -hmm. that wherever where she goes went, other yeah, places. it goes oh, and it cool. gets. Okay. So the Instagram lately, which is at Big Tinfoil Ball, 
Um, the ball went with her to a couple of restaurants in Meridian, and the ball went to the zoo for the oh, zoo that's show. Awesome. So there's some pictures of the ball hanging out at the zoo, and I was like, we got to get this, the ball on a water slide by the yes. end. Yes, <laughs> by the end of the summer, I got to have a picture of the ball on a, oh, on a water awesome. slide. Yeah, the so ball should go places out. for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anywhere we go on tour, mm. we want to take the ball yes. with us. So we can go and ball. No, it's a great to, concept. We should get Cherie on, Thanks. and she yeah, can bring the to. ball yes. into the studio. Yes. Here. Please yes. book Cherie. I would love okay. to talk to her. Cherie is fascinating She's to talk amazing. to. Yeah. When you watch her do Pun Slam, you're like, that's a fucking headline. <laughs> yeah. right Everything she <laughs> and says. And in these fun. notes, too. Yeah, yep. she was great. Yeah. yeah. That was awesome. So do you know anything about this game show we've mentioned <laughs> Once or twice. So I've heard far. talk about the game show because Jen wanted to do a rotation of different forms on Thursdays. Yes. Mm -hmm. And one of those was the game show. Yes. Okay. And I've seen improvised game shows in a lot of different forms. Mm -hmm. So, like, actually, if you want to go back to the first time I met Jen, period, it was while I was still working at that other theater, I produced a showcase um, of a bunch of different forms because I was showing that other theater. This is how you artistic direct a theater. We're going to try out six different shows and you can see which ones work so you can then add them to the schedule. And one of the shows in that rotation was the match game. Okay. And the host uh, only did one round because he was supposed to do two. If you've ever seen an episode of the match game, uh -huh. yep. he only did one round. <laughs> And then he went to the finals, and Jen was <laughs> Jen was one of our celebrity panelists. Oh, so she came in uh, in a hurry. She sat down on the panel. Then they underused her because oh. they only did one round, right? And she was out. Uh, um, but I've seen Match Game. Um, Jared Stull pitched me uh, pitched me and Nicole an idea he wanted to do. I'm trying to remember what it was. It had to do with famous movie quotes. And I was like, well, what if we took a famous movie quote while the audience member was out of the room, and then we improvised a scene around the famous movie quote, and the audience member had to guess what the right. famous movie quote was. So there's a lot of different forms of mm -hmm. improv game show. Uh, I've got other shows that I've, I've said to Jen, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure what form specifically you're referring to. Okay, gotcha. Well, we pitched Jen a game show. Okay. And at the exact same time, Jen was thinking game show. Yeah, yeah. And thinking you guys. So she yeah, was thinking prom. us as hosts. So when we had her in here for the seven-hour marathon. Yeah, she said we, us, you, We're and hosts. her should all get together. Yes. We only and, have six hours to go. Yeah. And, <laughs> and she's like, planning. we got to get white coats are there bathroom breaks in the seven hours <laughs> there, there weren't there were, many well no i think <laughs> i ever had a point in seven i'm not gonna make <laughs> seven hours of the yeah, bathroom no break. no no yes well, so white coats yeah she are said just we like white, flashy coats school, game show those, sports coats yeah because we were gonna we're down. gonna be the hosts so yeah i want to come back and i'm guessing the medium we didn't really decide no but where she wanted improv to use would the come screens. in um, the only thing that I came up and I mean, I know, I don't know shit about improv Cut. would be, uh, a game you called, uh, you're improvising right now. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would be, uh, I called it movie mania, just a working title where, uh, improvers would act out a few movies and then the contestants would have to guess what the, where they came from. Now, I don't know. <laughs> What's the time limit on the movie? Uh well we're in a game show so you know so you have to act out all of Jaws in under right, right, right. In no under no, 60 no it could be just like a popular scene from Jaws or something uh, oh man so I, I would prefer the the half life of it where you go you're gonna do all of Jaws in sixty seconds okay oh, okay so that, I mean that would because if I did an icon if you gave me Jaws and you could and you yeah. do do an iconic scene from Jaws I would improvise the Indianapolis monologue the finest monologue finest piece of acting ever set to film. And if you've seen Jaws, you're gonna get it. And if you mm -hmm. haven't, you're yeah. not. But it's very recognizable. Gotcha. It's that extra filter mm -hmm. of let's do the whole movie in 30 seconds. Dang. Okay, gotcha. That then you, you're gonna go because you have to have a chance to get it wrong. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Improv is nothing if there's no risk to it. Yeah. Right? And whenever I see improv done safely, I'm like, mm, there's not a lot of right and wrong in improv, but. Yeah. 
you have to take risks and you okay. have to commit to taking those risks. Mm -hmm. And if there's no risk, what are you doing? Yeah. Right. Okay. Which is actually where more things than men came from. Okay. So it could be like a uh, 60 second movie or something like that. So yeah. You, okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, that's good. We're fucking talking to you right now. <laughs> Jen's great at coming up with titles. Uh -huh. So if you went, okay, we're going to reenact these movies in 60 seconds. I mean, she'd yeah. come up with something okay. real quick. They'd be like, that's what that uh, is. Uh, oh, okay. Good. Okay. So After we, this, we have to figure out a time when we're all available to sit down with Jen. And <laughs> figure some yeah, shit out, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I'm assuming she's wanting to start this around what's coming Fall. up, fall-ish time, you know, after summer's over and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah, game show's supposed to be happening soon, and it's going to involve us, and sounds like some improv. We're also going to, there's going to be consequences. If you ever watch, like, a uh, family game fight, with Dax Shepard and it's like pie Kristen. in the face kind of stuff. Are you telling like, me there's Kristen Bell material out there? I have <laughs> not Kristen seen. Bell, yeah, watch Family yeah, Game Fight. Yes, Dax you Shepherd should. And, it's yeah, hilarious. they do a game show. Family I game love yes, Kristen it's Bell. Hilarious. It's on. Dax Shepard is one of the Hulu. few people on the on. planet I am jealous of. Hulu, watch it. Oh, Kristen Bell <laughs> yes. is your human. Family Game Fight. I've I've got a lot of humans. Oh, okay. I mean, I don't drink and I don't smoke generally. So you got so This is an illusion. <laughs> oh, <okay>. um, gotcha. <laughs> but I I get crushes real yeah. easy and especially on talent right and, you should watch that oh then. my god it's, kristen it's, bell on the good place is the, one of the oh, finest I love the good oh place. yeah holy oh, crap great yeah show. she's yeah. amazing yeah yeah and we we've been watching that show like okay we want the the game show to be like this yeah i actually even modeled some of our games yeah. after that game yeah. show so yeah. i'll have yeah, to watch them yeah, i never out. watched veronica mars I've never seen that. But either. I was always fond of Kristen Bell. And yeah. Good Place is just like, oh, she's um, amazing. Good Place. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite movies that Wendy hated was Forgetting Sarah Marshall. You okay. hated hate Forgetting it? Sarah Marshall? Why did I hate it? It was too, puppet musical? It was too sexual oh, for I'm, you. Yeah. I have a lot of blocks based on my background. Okay. On yeah. yeah. If anything's too crude or something, mm. I, uh, yeah. I almost can't. So there's I not implode. a lot of filmed comedy you can watch these days. Well, Fairly Brothers, you're never touching. I don't know. It depends know on how brothers. women are treated. If women okay. are uh, right. objectified, I really struggle. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. That's so. tough. But it? I'm going to yeah. do EMDR, folks, like and if, get over yeah. this. Have you seen Men, the horror movie Men? No. No. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a trip. The first half of it is really, really good. And then the second half is absurd. Mm. So it's very divisive. Oh, weird. And... I left it going, this would have been a wonderful movie if it had been written by a woman. <laughs> and I'm just watching this male filmmaker who made Ex Machina, which is an incredible movie. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to make this statement about the female experience because all the men in this creepy small town are played by the same actor. Oh, jeez. And they're really making the statement of how abusive men are and how they're all the same. And... And because she's there that. trying to get over the trauma of her husband committing suicide, oh, committing geez. suicide. Right. He may have, he may not have. It's up to you to decide as a viewer. But then it reaches a point that from a male perspective, this makes no sense. Right. But if a woman had made the film in any way, shape or form, you're saying something. Right. Mm -hmm. And it comes across disingenuous coming from this male filmmaker. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. So. laughs> I, yeah, I can deconstruct just about it. <laughs> Sorry. Well, this has been awesome. Like I, I want to like, talk comic books real quick. Oh, comic books. Yes. You just, you just got your stuff in a new place. Um. Yeah. Well, I've got two existing. Okay. Uh, so I've got Village Antiques in Nampa, and I've got Abracadabra Antiques in Caldwell. So you buy the comic books, then yep. you you put them. You ask, can we sell them in your location, or how does that? Well, I have uh, contracts with both of those venues, um, where yeah, it's my booth. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. whenever I buy a collection, some of it comes out, gets sold online, mm -hmm. and then the rest of it goes into the store to be sold by to be bought by people going there. And mm -hmm. then I'm working on a third location because I've been working with sports card fanatics over in Garden City off of Chinden, it's like Chinden and Forty Fifth, and I've been organizing their comic book because they're a sports card place and they do mm -hmm. Pokemon and they do Star Wars, but their mm -hmm. comic books. They didn't have an expert pricing, or, or so I was like, I can price all those for you, organize the stock, and give you something that's actually saleable. Mm -hmm. 
and they've been paying me an hourly wage to oh, wow. organize, and I'm doing it in trade credit. Mm-hmm. So I'm going through this collection that goes back to the 50s and mm-hmm. pulling, I want that, and I want that, and then oh, I refer wow. some of it to people I know. Uh, mm. So comic book collectors come in and they pull the cowboy books and the the cartoon, the Woody Woodpecker and the Mickey Mouse and the po- and the Popeye, um, which are usually difficult for a comic dealer to sell. Okay, but I'm working on that location as well. But that's their books, and then I'm hoping to pitch to them. I want to add you to my rotation, so you take a percentage of whatever I sell. And your inventory is going to go into my rotation, but you're going to get my books in exchange when those rotate out. So, yeah, so it's, it's a. How com- do you know all this about comic books? Just starting as a kid or? You got a favorite sport? Oh, okay. you're not asking that question. <laughs> uh, I've read off and on. I started, the first comic book I ever read was in second grade. And it was a student marketplace. You know, you earn fake money for classroom behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they hold a marketplace where people bring shit from home. And then they trade the shit from home for the fake money. Okay. And it's supposed to teach economics. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I bought an issue of Marvel Tales that was a reprint of Amazing Spider-Man number 114. Um, And I started reading. Then in junior high, because I didn't get into it, my parents didn't support me getting into it, but in junior high, uh, I was walking near my school one weekend, and it was the month that the black suit came out. Spider-Man in the Black Suit. Okay. Don't know. So, oh, you don't? You know who no. Venom is? I know who Venom is, yeah, okay. but I don't know comic books. <laughs> so, I was only an Archie Archie. Ah, yeah. We've got a lot of Archie. It doesn't move well. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> Archie, yeah. uh, Amazing Spider Man 252 is the first appearance of the black suit in the main title. And then you get a Marvel team up and a Peter Parker that both have the black suit. But you don't know where it came from because Secret Wars number one was published that same month. And the black suit doesn't appear until Secret Wars number eight. Mm. And so I was walking past the, the rack and I was like, what the hell is that? Spider Man in a black suit. And this is 1983. So Spider-Man has gone 20 years in the red and blues. Ah. And I'm like, what the hell are they doing? And so I bought those and I started reading again. Mm -hmm. And my mom supported that at that point. So I had a subscription and all that. Then I started doing, to a bunch of books. And then I started doing improv. And uh, in the mid 90s, one of my improvisers owned a comic book store. So I actually sold uh, the collection I had at that point to help put me through college. Oh, awesome. Which included the first appearance of Venom and the first appearance of Deadpool. Oh, wow. I've gotten the Deadpool back. Not that specific issue, but I've gotten one back. Mm-hmm. I still don't have a first appearance of Venom. Uh, Spider-Man 300. I'll get it sooner or later. Right. But don't have one yet. So do you have some that you keep forever? In oh, yeah. Home? yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I got back into it. So my relationship with comic books has been cyclical. So for a long time, I didn't have a comic book collection at all. And then I took that driving tour of the United States and I drove through Sandpoint. Sandpoint, Idaho. Yeah. Okay. And in Sandpoint, there was a beautiful city. Um, There's a store called Foster's Crossing. And so, you know, I was exploring and on the wall of the building, it says they have comics. That sounds fun. So I went up and I found this room full of comics and it was Avengers. There were all these really, really old books. And I'm like, these should not be out on display like this or as cheap as their oh, mark really? dad. So I spent three hours because it's Avengers in the teens. I spent three hours pricing books and I came to the conclusion that the vendor was selling them at about 40% of market value. And probably had no idea. No, he had total idea. That's his business model. Oh, gotcha. So I bought $100 worth of books (laughs) because I was like, I know jack about comic books at this point, Mm. really. And I'm like, let me test what I know. And I bought my favorite comic book story. Which is X Men one forty one one forty two Nightmares of No Days of Futures Past, which was made into a movie, um, and I bought Alpha Flight number one, and then when I was in San Antonio, I had them all graded, and they came back high grades except for one forty two, which came back six point oh because of a food stain, but I was like, uh, my so value. you can take them to somebody and they go through them and. 
tell you what they're worth or I mean, yeah, that 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 scale is subjective. Okay. Mm-hmm. But there are grading companies, there's two major grading companies that you can mail them off and they will encapsulate them in in plastic and okay. give them a grade. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I submitted 3 books and I asked the store when I was submitting if I was selling these what would they be worth and what would you give me for them? And they said, well, these would be worth about 25 bucks each and we would be buying because these are in demand. So if you're selling – and I had paid 85 for the three of them. So I'm like, yeah, I'm in demand. I'm in the ballpark Yeah, because they want to pay a wholesale price of 75 and mm-hmm. I paid 85. So right. pretty good. my evaluation is good. Yeah. And then I, they sent them off to be graded and they got the grades I expected except for the one with the food stain. Um and so I contacted Foster's Crossing and went, hey, can I buy comic books over the internet? And they said, no, <laughs> but we will put you in contact with the vendor. And so they put me in contact with the vendor and I spent about $500 a month. Wow. Because my money guy, my then money guy told me, you're going to die with your student loan. Ah. <laughs> I was like, okay, so I don't have any money to leave to my kids. What do I do about <laughs> that? Buy some comic books. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, I need to build a physical asset yeah. that I can give to them that the government can't touch. Right. Mm. What do I know? I know comic books. Right. So I started buying $500 a month from that guy and building a collection that I could pass off to my kids. Oh, wow. And so when I decided to move here, he's the one that said, you want to partner up. So, yeah, I've been back in comic books since, what is that, 2019, since June of 2019, Mm -hmm. and I've built a fairly expensive and impressive comic book collection in the three years since then. Yeah, I'm always seeing it on Instagram, right? You're posting things. Uh, I post some stuff. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean- I've seen some stuff on Facebook. Facebook? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. My Instagram syncs to my Facebook. Okay. So a lot of times I post, well, I found this. This is up for sale. I never know. Yeah. Yay, are we happy? I don't know what, I don't know comic books, so I never know what to say about that, you know? Have I posted it? I'm proud of it. Yeah, it's a good thing. There's plenty of common books that don't make the posts. Yeah. Yeah. Like I posted Guardians, the first appearance of the Guardians of the Galaxy. That's pretty cool. Mm. Right. But, I mean, Doctor Strange number 71. So How do these, uh, how does one become cooler than the other? Obviously, the first appearance of something, but is is there? There's there's a lot of different conditions that go into it. Oh, okay. Mm. One of them is the scarcity of the book. So, like, there's a trade paperback. I was talking about this yesterday. There's a trade paperback of the limited series Squadron Supreme. Um, Not characters anybody cares about. They haven't been in a movie or TV show. They're the Marvel ripoff of the Justice League. Okay. But the writer of the limited series, when he died, his... Ash, he was cremated, and the ashes were mixed with the printing ink. Whoa. So there's a trade cool. paperback mm. of the Squadron Supreme that's worth $150 because He's Mark Gruenwald's it. ashes are in oh, it. Wow. Whoa. Mm. So it's how scarce is the particular collectible. Mm-hmm. It's what condition is it in, and it's what, dem- what demand is there for it. Right. And usually what I say to my kids is if you're evaluating the value of a book, well, how much did the book change the world? Um, If you go back to the 1950s, which is the the early 1950s, all of the 1940s is golden age comic books, cover price is 10 cents. Mm -hmm. I will usually tell people, uh, and I can talk on this topic for a long time, so cut me off. (laughs) I tell people um, the lower the cover price, the more interested I am. Because I have oh, okay. friends that look for it, look for books. I'm like, if it's twelve cents or ten cents, get it. I right. don't care what it is. Mm. But in the fifties, um, if it's a western, if it's Tarzan, if it's Turok vamp, uh, not vampire dinosaur hunter, it's probably not worth that much because there's not a ton of demand for it. Mm-hmm. And this is pre comics code, so a lot of the horror books that are coming out and pre code horror books are a category that collectors demand Mm -hmm. western they don't care but horror led to a book called seduction of the innocent which was writing that comic books were 
corrupting the minds of the youth. Oh, fascinating. So a lot of stuff that came out before Seduction of the Innocent either succumbed to the paper drive in the war effort mm -hmm. or they got burned because of Seduction of the Innocent. Wow. So we don't have accurate counts on anything that came out in that era. We don't know how many copies of Superman number one there are. Oh. Or Action Comics number one, because a lot of the print run means nothing. Okay. This is the max, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and there's no other superhero books without uh, Action Comics number one, mm -hmm. really. Detective 27, first appearance of Batman, million dollar book. Wow. Amazing Fantasy 15, first appearance of Spider Man, 1962. That's worth a lot of money. Captain America number one is a World War II era book, worth a lot of money. Um, Have you ever seen him? Oh, yeah. Oh, you have? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go to conventions, there's folks like Torpedo Comics out of Vegas that bring the big guns with them. Mm. Trying to sell or just Trying to get you, you their booth. Oh, okay. They may, I mean, maybe they get a collector who's ready to pull the trigger on a six, seven figure wow. book, but you're going to come to their booth to look at it. Right. Which means you might stay and buy something. Right. Which yeah. is where they make the money. Yeah. Um, My son at one point was ashamed to tell me. Dad, Peter's not my Spider-Man. <laughs> Miles is my Spider-Man. <laughs> he was, was ashamed? Like, yeah. Were you he disappointed? Was, he was, no, I was quite the opposite. I was like, kid, you've got a Spider-Man. <laughs> I don't care which one speaks to you more. I'm proud of you that that's where you are. Because those of us that don't grow up in the church... We choose our ethics from a different source sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've had an argument with somebody once that um, if your ethics come from the comic books, they still come from the Bible because Stan Lee, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Stan Lee was Jewish. So <laughs> yeah. I'm going to argue Old yeah. Testament. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you learn integrity from Daredevil and responsibility from, I mean, you learn a lot of ethics okay. from Peter Parker. All right. So but comic the first appearance, books were your Bible. Yeah. I think I think that's fairly safe to say. Maybe not the books themselves, but the media that came from yeah. them. Interesting. But like when I tell my Miles is his Spider-Man, the first appearance of Miles Morales is in 2011. Mm -hmm. And that's a four-figure book now. Wow. Yeah. So I'm like, Alex, how much does it change the world? Mm -hmm. That's got a cover price of like two bucks, three bucks. Mm -hmm. So it's not something you'd think I was going to look at, right. or look for, but it's got a scarcity to it. If it's in a high grade, it's worth over a thousand dollars. It's in demand because that character speaks to so many people. Mm -hmm. And when a movie comes out that uses a character. It ups the. The yeah, this, the sweet spot is between the trailer and the release of the film. Oh, okay. Because then the spec is very hot. Mm -hmm. And then when the thing comes out, you're 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 Kinda. privy to how good the piece of work is. Oh. So like Eternals is the big example right now. Mm -hmm. The value of everything Eternals went way up in the anticipation for the movie coming out. And then the movie was not all that popular. So then the went way back down. Yeah. But Miles had Into the Spider-Verse, which then earned an Oscar for Best Animated Feature, and an announcement of a second one coming, plus the popular soundtrack, plus he's got his oh, still wow. got his own books, and it continues to climb. Yeah. Just like Superman defined the genre. And yeah, you can get me talking about comics. <laughs> yeah, my I students mean, always knew all you had to do to get me off topic was talk comic. about comic. not just comic <laughs> books, but comic book media production. Right. Yeah. I can tell like, you why wanna... Quicksilver died <laughs> in Age of Ultron. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not a, yeah. I don't, like, I mean, comics for me when I was a kid, you know, I always read the Sunday comics in the paper. You know, you had Family Circus mm -hmm. and Kathy and like you said, Archie and stuff. But as far as the superheroes, Archie stuff, and Veronica. Oh yeah, but as far as the superhero stuff, and Veronica, huh? not Betty. Yeah, I like Veronica. <laughs> I like Veronica too. I'm a Veronica guy. Yeah, but I, as a kid, I never really got into superhero stuff. And honestly, looking back at it, I almost wish I wish I had. Yeah, because I honestly feel like my imagination would be better than it is now. It's I... never too late to get in. <laughs> it's never oh too late to get never in. Too late. <laughs> He's a pusher. Uh, yeah, I got plenty of them. I'll go, I'll give, first one's free. Yeah, right. I'll give, yeah, right. yeah. I'll give the first one's free. <laughs> 
right to the R. I've got people that I give books to. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like Ken. Ken likes uh, Dell and Goldkey, which is all the cartoon stuff and the Western stuff. And mm. I'm like, yeah, I can't sell that. You're the only one who wants it. So oh, okay. here you go. <laughs> Yeah, I'll cut you a real good deal. Yeah. So it's it's the superhero stuff that sells and is worth money. Is that correct? Um, the superhero stuff is the easy stuff to move. Okay. Like I, when I'm buying a collection, I often value it based on what their Spider-Man population is. Okay. Like I had a guy show me two or three short boxes that was all Spider-Man, mm-hmm. but somebody had picked through it beforehand and bought all the keys. Mm-hmm. And was, I was like, where's 361? And he goes, I already sold it. Where's 300? I already sold it. Those are the first appearances of Carnage and Venom, respectively. Mm-hmm. Oh. And I'm going, yeah, those are the ones that are worth money. So for everything that's left, it's stock that will move, but I'm not going to pay you two bucks a book for it. So mm-hmm. I offered him like $200 for the two books and he decided, and boxes, and he decided to pass on it. And I was like, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you let people buy the keys out of it. Okay, gotcha. Um, what question was I answering? After I don't that? know if there was a question. It's I think I just made a statement. In. Yeah, but anyway. oh, it's the superhero stuff that moves. That's right. Gotcha. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I don't. I know. I've been drinking too. Now, so let's get back to improv real quick. Okay. If people want, say, I'm here for seven hours. If that's what you want, <laughs> I'm I'm into beating <laughs> records. <laughs> oh, God. The, oh Jesus! Damn. I want the highest viewer count. <laughs> I want the longest podcast. Yeah. I want as many oh, no. records yeah. as I can get. Well, the one with Jen wasn't even a podcast. No. It was a meeting it that. Fizzled. Seven hours. What's yeah. the longest podcast? I think What's the longest one of these episodes has been? Two, two and a half hours. Maybe. Done. We're yeah. only <laughs> it's only right. eight thirty five now, yes. so we got an hour fifteen to go. Do I need to take off clothes to increase viewership? I'm maybe, there. maybe, yes. I'm only two and a half bottles of fireball in. <laughs> Let the host talk, Rob. Yes. I, uh, okay, what's my train of thought here? <laughs> you wanted to get back to improv. Oh yes. So uh, if people say like myself, I don't know much about improv. This is my most, the most education I've had on yeah. improv. I've watched a little bit of like Middle Ditch and Schwartz on Netflix. God bless you. What? So Middle Ditch and Schwartz is actually ripping off the TJ and Dave format. Oh, oh okay. Really? Yeah. So th- TJ it- and Dave are not famous. Oh, okay. So they couldn't, yeah, they, they so have they're been the ones weekly that in Chicago for a long positions, time. positions, right? That's called, called ghosting. ghosting. Yes, ghosting. I've learned. That is amazing. I've mentioned that to you and uh, Nick Roberts, uh, who I met at Watson's one right. night. And so, yeah, he's like, that's ghosting. Because to me, that was kind of not being an improv and just watching it when they were in a scene and they switch characters. Mm-hmm. It's like, holy shit, that's yeah. fucking amazing. Yeah, yeah so, Nick, Nick got that technique from me. Oh, did he? Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So what do you have? Like a cue? Or you know each other so well or something? Or No. Wow. No. It's like if you have two people and they need to play more than two characters, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. then when the assumption in that type of show is that you don't own the character you're playing. Mm-hmm. And it's a mindset. Like if you're an actor playing a scripted role, it's your role. Nobody right. else is going to play that role. So sometimes it's a step to go. Everybody on every character we create on stage mm-hmm. belongs to both of us. Mm-hmm. So like the classroom in Middle Edition Schwartz is going to require 15 people, which they do. But you decide that for this portion of the scene, you want to play. You start with characters A and B, and then you want to go add C's perspective and do something different. And A goes, well, we need B's perspective for this moment. Somebody has to play B. Mm -hmm. So that's the thought process that you're sharing all these roles. And the trick to it is to have each of those characters have a distinctive characteristic so you you can recognize who's playing who. And usually they don't move a lot. So you can also recognize where they are in the room. Mm, So if you watch that Middle Ditch and Schwartz set, one of the things that's fun for me to watch is you'll notice when they fuck up. Oh. They lose track of who's where. Okay. And who's like, there's literally a point and they go, where they go, wasn't there a dude right here <laughs> between this character and yeah. this character? I want to say his name was Nigel, but there was a dude right yeah. here. And yeah, the, yeah that's okay. them fucking up and going, oh, one of us is supposed to play that. Right. Okay. But okay. the beauty of improv is sometimes you're going to fuck up when right. you take those risks. But that's mm. what's awesome, too, and right? Yeah, well, I mean, just roll with it. To yeah. not be afraid of it. Yeah. yeah. To go, if we fuck up, we're going to go yeah. down in flames and we're going to make that be fun. Right. So you take the risk and mm. commit to it. 
But you were headed for a question about uh Well, I was going to say, it. like, yeah, someone like myself who hasn't seen a ton of improv, what would you suggest to someone like myself to basically sell them on improv? Would it be a middle ditch in Schwartz watching that or something else? Go see Things in Company. <laughs> things oh, in Company. Yeah. Okay. Thursdays? When's the next show? Uh, our next show is uh, we have two scheduled in August, and we're trying to figure out the schedule. What's overall. the basket case? Is that improv? Well, basket, as well? basket case was gonna be the Thursday showcase where she wanted to alternate the stand up with the improv okay. set, mm-hmm. so that the headliner for the weekend had another night to do, and then right. we could sell, and then we would end with, um, we would do an improv set based on the stand-up set. Oh, wow. Because mm. Jan saw that. It's a modified Armando is the form, uh, which is what Tinfoil does. Mm-hmm. It's an Armando. Um, Jan saw that in New York and came back, and there's a challenge to that because you don't want to do the punchlines of the stand-up because hopefully they've already explored those ideas. You have to look between the cracks of it and find the ideas they haven't fully mm. explored and then play those scenes. And we tried it out with Monica Nevy, mm-hmm. and we did the anti-intervention, which is one of our favorite. You, it was You're Not Doing Enough Drugs <laughs> uh, and was one of our favorite scenes. It, yeah. made, it made the ball. Uh-huh. And Monica loved what we did with that. And we wrestled with, well, do we do a set based on the headliner which then makes us the closer and might be a human capital risk with mm-hmm. the headliner needs to feel like the biggest person mm-hmm. in the room. Or do we do it off the feature and then therefore do it right before the headliner? And um, I think that's still in process to work out how Thursday night mm-hmm. works. Yeah. So we have two shows scheduled in August and – I believe the fourth is a Thursday. I can cuss, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I can't I believe think you, you already have. Yeah, you I haven't done it enough. But I'm going to cuss a lot okay, right good. now. Okay, so I wanted go. to make sure we didn't have a seven second no. delay button. Yeah. Hit. No. So Nikki Glazer has a show on HBO called F Boy Island mm. that I refuse to call F Boy Island. I call it Fuck Boy Island. Nice. Yeah. And I don't understand how anybody ever talked Nikki Glazer into not calling right, it right, right. Fuck yeah. Boy Island. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a dating show. And they have 24 guys and three girls. And of the 24 guys, 12 12 of them are fuckboys and 12 of them are nice guys. Mm. Okay. So over the course of the show, the three women have to each choose one guy. And at the end of the show, uh, there's $100,000 at stake. Whoa. If they choose a nice guy, the two of them split the money right off happily into the sunset, whatever, they mm. do it together. If they choose the fuck boy, any of the fuck boys, the fuck boy gets the money. Oh, jeez. Oh. And season one is entirely available on HBO, and it's so damn funny. <laughs> it's so good. There's so many little details that I want to save because we're going to use them in the show. So I'm just going to give mm. you the basics. Okay. But of the three at the end, one of them chose a fuck boy. On purpose, and he kept the money. Whoa. And then Glazer goes, psych, you don't get the money. We're going to give the money to a charity in her name. Wow. So season two, the finale is next Thursday, and we're going to watch it live and frame a show around oh, cool. it oh, where cool. we're, it's like the the bachelor reunion show mm-hmm. yeah. so we're going to do or how did this get made if you ever listen to that so we're going to break down the fina- we're going to watch it in the lounge with the audience mm-hmm. and we're going to break it down and comment on it and have guests and and it's me and Sheree can't make it. She had to do another acting job. Um, Austin Von Johnson, hmm. Bree Jones. Oh, awesome. Um, we'll one be on of, here next week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Bree mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, I had coffee with them today. Oh. Um, and um, like one of the fuck boys is a rapper. So I hired a local rapper improviser nice. to come in and play <laughs> Brayden. Oh, awesome. And so we're doing this live reaction show. It's going to be like a tell-all kind of thing at yeah. the end of the season. Yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. So, yeah, and it's character-based. So how did this get made? They all react to shitty movies in as themselves. Mm. We're going to react to Fuckboy Island as characters. <laughs> mm. So I'm going to be I'm, – I'm leaning towards – 
a purveyor of high culture art who is also a fuck boy and he's going to host the show and then Bree is going to play a crew member whose NDA just expired. So she can talk about everything that happened behind the scenes on mm. two, but nothing on three. And then there's one. Yeah. I don't, don't want to give away too much, but we're going to yeah. play characters and talk about the show mm-hmm. and react to its absurdity. Okay. Nice. And we're all very excited. Cause I don't think like I, I've talked to the guys from turbo comics and I want to bring back their midnight movies and we want to show shitty horror films. Uh, we've got, uh, we want to do Velocipaster. And we want to do uh, Lamageddon. Those are both. <laughs> never heard of either of those? Oh, my God. Velocipaster yeah. and oh, Lamageddon. You got to watch Velocipaster. <laughs> Come watch it with us. But we want to show those <laughs> shitty movies. That, like every time I watch a what culture list, I gain like five more crappy horror movies mm. that I want to do. Uh, a, sh- a show for mm-hmm. I'm just tangenting now because I also <laughs> want the movie group that you saw last Thursday I want them to do horror movies all through October oh, that'd just be live awesome. improvised yeah. horror movies because yeah. one of our rehearsal ones was My Bloody St. Patrick's Day oh, wow. which was the sequel to My Bloody Valentine right? Mm-hmm. and we had a scene that we wished we'd filmed that the mine got flooded and the, the miner uh, slashed open the Achilles tendons of one of the victims and they had to swim through the underwater cavern oh, to get away from the killer. Maybe there's oxygen on the other side. And then he released a bag of piranha into the water <laughs> and we did this, the death scene in slow motion and we were all going, that was such a good scene. <laughs> oh God, I wish we had film of that. Yeah. Yeah. So the Fuckboy Island Redux is next Thursday, the, the 4th. Is that on okay. the lounge's site? I've um, seen it. The graphics just got done a couple oh, cool. days ago, okay. so the promo should be going out nice. soon. Now, someone who's never seen the show, would uh, would they be able to appreciate the live performance? Yeah, they should. Okay. They should, because the first segment of the show is going to be bringing people up to speed on what they know. Okay. okay. And then we're going to watch one of the season finale episodes, and then we're going to talk it out, uh, which will be a short segment, and then we'll do the other one. And then we'll do the full deconstruction comedy bit because I have ideas for the characters who are on the show that we're going to interview live, which is why I hired the rapper because mm-hmm. one of the fuck boys is a rapper right. who is on the show to blow up his Instagram. Yeah. So I hired a rapper to play him. Oh, that's okay. I hired a rock to play somebody else. Nice. That's giving too much away. <laughs> all right, all right. Too much away. <laughs> and then we have the back to school show. I want to say it's Saturday the 27th. And that's, yeah, that's going to be a showcase of improv and stand up and Andrew Lyman's producing that. And, uh, we're going to try and draw in the college crowd from the local colleges that are in the neighborhood. Mm. Um, so those two are the ones that we have on the schedule. We want to bring octopus challenge back. Uh, the movie group needs to do, uh, it's set. We have a meeting on that tomorrow. Okay. D's notes is going to start touring and doing shows. And we have a meeting nice. on that Monday. <clears throat> okay. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff in the pipeline. Like I know a ton of shows from the different theaters I've mm-hmm. worked at. And some of my favorites haven't even made it to the stage yet. Oh, nice. Wow. One of my favorite shows is Bill and Ted's history report. Ever seen, you ever seen Bill and Ted's excellent adventure? Uh, yeah, Long years ago, ago, years ago. Yeah. So, you know, at the end of it, um, they have all these historical figures and their job is to respond to modern day San Dimas. Mm. Um, well, Bill and Ted's history report, uh, a comedian or a performer pitches ahead of time who you're playing and what their angle is. Mm. And then you get five minutes of stage time to do that character as if they were in the finale of Bill and Ted's Excellent okay. Adventure. Oh, wow. So I saw somebody who just wanted to report on the bizarre things people died of in the 1880s, and it was fucking hilarious. Oh, really? I saw somebody play Steve Allen doing Steve Allen's actual act to show how badly some of that comedy <laughs> ages and how mm-hmm. it's not relevant. Yeah. But you can you can pitch and that's one of those it's really easy access cuz you can come from any background, you can prep it as much as you want, but you're pitching who you're playing and what their angle is. I also know a show called Set List, which is improvised stand up where you don't know what you're going to talk about because the premises for your bits are all built into a PowerPoint. 
and then project it on a screen on stage. Yeah. So every once in a while, you check to see what you're supposed to talk about, and then you improvise that oh chunk. My gosh. It's so hard. But if yeah. you if you YouTube that, you'll find Robin Williams, you'll find Bob Odenkirk, oh, wow. you'll find pros doing it at Meltdown Comics. Mm -hmm in Los Angeles and they're fucking you might also find me and I'm terrible <laughs> <laughs> well that's the one we're gonna look for yes, I, do. <laughs> I love that that show yeah oh, awesome <laughs> Sweet. Well, thank you so much for being Is here tonight. Is there anything? Uh, yeah, that we didn't, that we didn't cover that you want to get out. Oh, to we're, we're done. Our... <laughs> yeah, We've got carpet coming. Oh, you have stuff to do. Yeah, we Man, actually. I got a record to set here. People. <laughs> we're gonna have to have you back. We've got carpet being installed in a day oh, and a half, and, and we, gotta, we have to get We got to move furniture out of, out of our the freaking house. house. <laughs> I will come back anytime. Heck okay, yeah. great. You yeah, want to talk? Awesome. I'd okay, yeah, we'll do that. Robert Long 2.0, we'll definitely do it. Oh, we go. gotta have Cherie on. Yes. Cherie, yes. yeah, we'll get in contact yeah, with her, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, that'd be awesome. You want to talk to Zach Dagler, too, because he's going to take over Dee's notes. Oh, okay, Zach cool. Zach Dagler, I don't Zach know. Zach Dagler him. finished, uh, he's the one that Cherie beat in the finals of the Pun Slam. Oh, okay. Oh, Semi-finals. I, I, semi I, yes. I actually can picture his face right and now. And then Zach Jean was Jackie. the one that I, I he'll confirm this. In my second pun slam, I slaughtered him <laughs> in the finals because he went it. dry on the topic in the orchard, three jokes in. <laughs> so I spent a minute and a half roasting Just... <laughs> him with apple puns. Ah. I think we oh, were, we there. were at that. I remember there, there, this. That's yes, yeah, I yeah, remember yeah. apple yeah. puns. That was downstairs. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. yeah. But he came back that. to win one. Yes. And then he got to the semifinals and was eliminated the same round I was. Yeah. Wow. And he's already qualified for December, if I remember and right. And you are as well? Yeah, that... I, I got in January. I've been trying to tell people I want to be the villain of the Pun Slam. Oh, okay. Because mm -hmm. you can't keep coming back to play mm -hmm. without leaning into the arrogance and the villainy of it. Right. So I look at it like Bloodsport or Kickboxer, the mm -hmm. crappy Jean-Claude Van Damme movie. Same right. movie. I want them to build a platform. Yeah, the same movie. <laughs> I want them to build a platform for me in the back of the room oh, so cool. I can sit up there and just stalk back and forth considering <laughs> how, how good are these people? Can I kill them? Yeah. Yes, I can kill them. Right. And I want to be able to call my shots like the bad guy in kickboxer yeah. this is where i'm going to hit you <laughs> so then when somebody beats me in december everybody's happy about it and excited right i just think improv and comedy can take a lot from pro wrestling and i and i look oh, at it a lot that way <laughs> oh yeah mm -hmm. so you're not allowed to go up each month is that correct um it's not that i'm not allowed to go up because i go up every month because okay. i want to stay sharp okay uh and at this point i've started trying to do things that are more challenging i gotta make this short because you have carpet coming <laughs> um so this last well to answer your question since i qualified in january i can't make the finals so i'm not scored okay mm. so i still perform okay. i still play yeah because mm. if i were to play in january and then not do it again until december i'd be, be fat and out of shape yeah. and right mm. now i'm only fat no wait, <laughs> no i am fat and out of shape um so I go up every month and I've been trying to do stuff. I'm like, how can I make this harder on myself? Mm -hmm. So this last one, I usually, I draw my topic. I make sure I draw something I haven't done before. And then I go upstairs to write. Mm -hmm. Well, this last one, first round, I showed up at 640. And I'm usually there at six o'clock. So I have an hour You're to write. You're the first one usually, right. aren't you? Yeah. Because I want all that time to write out the thing and revise yeah. it and figure out connections. And I have no problem showing my process with that with people because I just love sharing skill and and seeing what I can steal from other people to elevate everybody. Right. Um, but this time I showed up with minimal amount of time and I wrote a list of words, uh, which is always the first step in writing the whole script. Mm -hmm. I went up on stage and I went, I haven't written anything. I wrote this list of words. Because the month before, I drew last for round two because I usually assume if I draw last, I'm going to go last, right. which gives me the amount of time. But Tiffany flipped it on me. Uh -huh. So I drew last and went first. Oh, dang. So I had only written three sentences. Right. So I stood up there telling, taking words, 
giving the pun and crossing it off. And then Tiffany commented on it. She was like, this is what he just did, which is funny because I essentially stole it from Megan McCaleb. Oh. Because when Megan runs through what she scripted, she goes, I have time left. Shit. What words do I still have? Oh. And she goes back to her list and she starts crossing off words and going, this is a joke. So I did something that people are impressed with that I got from somebody else. Right. Well, that's cool, though. Yeah. So yeah. I did that. And then the second round, I went, I didn't write anything at all because I'm going to have you throw the words at me. And I'm going to come up with the pun on the spot, and Danny's going to keep score of what works and what didn't. And he said I went six and one, and I thought I went five and two, mm -hmm. uh, which is cool. And then somebody approached me at the bar afterwards, and I explained to him what the joke I meant to do that I knew tanked was. The suggestion was bolo tie, and I started building a bullfighter joke. And I missed the middle of it because the bullfighter was supposed to throw bolas. Oh, okay. And I didn't mention that. Yeah. And so I whiffed the joke, but I explained the rest of it to somebody who was like, that would have been a damn good <laughs> joke. <Right. Yeah. laughs> and then the button to that one was somebody yelled tidy whities And I went, well, we live in Idaho. <laughs> Entire audience erupted, yeah. and I went to Danny and went, that was the button. I'm done. <laughs> right. I'm out. Yeah, so I'm still looking for how can I make this harder between right. now and okay. December because yeah. right. i got to stay sharp. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I'd be looking for the easy out myself. <laughs> I know. That's right, why well, we're not doing it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, apparently sometime in the future, we're going to all be working together on a game show. Yes, coming up soon. So. Yes, that'd be awesome. Well, thank you so much for being thank here. We got to get the hell out of here. Yes, I'm awesome. honored and flattered. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm signing out. I'm signing off. I'm Chris Adams. I'm Wendy Moser. Hashtag get toasted. Stay toasted. Oh. Thank you so much, Robert. That's toasted. okay. I think we got him toasted. Slightly toasted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so Let's much. Let's make sure we get a photo. Oh, yes. We suck at that. <laughs> <laughs>